It is a pleasure to speak to you once again about a topic that I have been involved with for the last 20 years. Um, the uh, universal definition of myocardial infarction began with a dinner party uh, where Christian Tuzin and I, uh, a good Christian and I are good friends. Christian uh, is a, a professor of cardiology at uh, Aarhus University in Denmark, um, and he and I had collaborated on a number of projects, and we were having a dinner um, in 1998 in Atlanta, Georgia at the time of the American College of Cardiology meeting, and we're wondering why there were so many conflicting results um, in trials for uh, patients with acute myocardial infarction. And it turned out that, uh, as we talked about it, we discovered that the conflict was the result of different definitions. Each trial had entered different patients because they had defined myocardial infarction differently. So uh, we, at that time, were able to get the American College of Cardiology and uh, the uh, European Society of Cardiology together for some meetings in an attempt to come up with a single definition for MI so that when somebody in Moscow said this patient has had a myocardial infarct, uh, it would be the same as in Tucson, Arizona, when I said somebody has had a myocardial infarct, or somebody in Denmark, and so forth. In other words, the whole world would define myocardial infarction similarly. Gradually, uh, the American Heart Association joined this group and the World Heart Federation. So all of the major world heart organizations have now joined in this issue of the universal definition. And you can see here that the, the idea of a universal definition has been around for quite a while. WHO, World Health Organization, was already looking for a, a universal definition um, back uh, uh, you know, in the 1950s, and they uh, multiple times revised their definition, but their definition is an epidemiologic definition. It's used when you have a retrospective chart review. Uh, it's not one that's useful for clinicians. So you can see we published the first document um, in, a, uh, in 2000, and subsequently uh, the document has been revised um, three other times to the fourth uh, uh, definition document that was just published um, a year ago simultaneously in circulation, Journal of the American College of Cardiology, the European Heart Journal, and Nature Cardiology Reviews. Um, and so I'm going to very briefly take you through this. I think many people in the audience will already have heard of the different subtypes of myocardial um, infarction. So we start with a very general term. A myocardial injury is detected when troponin or another biomarker, CKMB, but we prefer, far prefer a troponin and we far prefer the high sensitivity troponin when it is elevated above the 90 ninth percentile of the upper reference limit or the upper limit of normal. Um, and this injury is considered acute if there's a rise and fall in values. As I will show you, uh, there are some patients who have chronically elevated eleva uh, levels of troponin because of chronic ongoing injury to the myocardium. So here you see the curve. In purple, it shows you an acute injury. The troponin rises. The green area is the normal range. Uh, this is high sensitivity. Troponin, you can see the uh, blue curve rises, the value rises well above the 99th uh, percentile URL because that's the upper limit of that green bar. Um, and then falls gradually. Generally, uh, uh, depending on how high it goes, it takes five days to even 10 or 12 days. But you see the dotted blue line in the middle, that's an ongoing chronic injury. It's also elevated, and that's a very different animal from uh, the acute uh, injury to the myocardium. Myocardial infarction is one of many examples of, myocar of acute myocardial injuries. It is the myocardial injury that's due to ischemia. And consequently, um, uh, we are trying with the definition to reflect the underlying pathophysiology or pathological condition that leads to acute MI. So acute myocardial infarction defined by the pathologist the same way we do. It's defined as myocardial cell death 
due to prolonged ischemia. So this is the definition from the 2018 document. In fact, it differs very little from the original definition, um, but there are there's new information to come along. There are subtypes of myocardial infarction that have been added with the various uh, revisions to the document over the years. Um, so the definition is a rise and fall of cardiac biomarkers, preferably high sensitivity troponin, at least one value over the 99th percentile for the upper reference limit or the upper limit of normal. And there has to be clinical information that supports the idea that ischemia is causing this injury. What are these clinical factors? Well, they're the ones that we use every day. The patient's history that's very suggestive of myocardial ischemia. New ischemia electrocardiographic changes, ST's elevation, ST depression, um, development of new pathological Q waves in the, e in the electrocardiogram suggesting a, a previous myocardial infarction, or imaging evidence of loss of viable myocardium or a new regional wall motion abnormality. For example, the patient had an echo two years ago that was normal left ventricular function, and now the inferior wall is no longer moving. That's evidence that, that supports the idea that the elevation in troponin was due to an inferior wall myocardial infarction. And as we know, um, the, uh, t perhaps 10, 12 percent of patients who have an acute MI, the coronary arteries are not uh, uh, not terribly abnormal, and we're going to hear more about that later. The so-called Minoka myocardial infarction without coronary obstruction. We'll um, we'll hear about that in a subsequent talk. It's a very interesting entity. So there are five sub subtypes of myocardial infarction. The one we treat um, with, as we've been hearing about all morning long, with either thrombosis thrombolytics or, or preferably with angioplasty is the type 1 MI. It's due to plaque rupture or erosion as we just heard from uh, Professor Crea. Um, and uh, uh, there, the thrombus can be totally occlusive or partially occlusive. So this is the one we treat every single day with standard guidelines from the European Society of Cardiology and the American College of Cardiology slash uh, American Heart Association. Characteristics of a type 1 MI is that it's usually spontaneous and onset, onset with discomfort that develops often in the early morning hours. The underlying process, we've talked about plaque erosion, fissuring, a rupture with subsequent intracoronary thrombus formation. Almost all ST elevation MIs are in this category and also ST depression MIs are in this category. Patients do not present with a serious medical illness or a marked arrhythmia on top of this. It's usually the disease by itself. A type 2 MI is one in which there's not plaque erosion or rupture. There may be vasospasm. There may be a, a oxygen a supply demand imbalance. For example, the patient who comes to the emergency room with rapid atrial fibrillation and a heart rate of 150, um, the subendocardium uh, becomes ischemic because of the excessively fast heart rate, but there's been no plaque rupture or erosion. Um, there can also be in, in, in a minority of patients patients, a non-atherosclerotic coronary dissection, or it can be endothelial dysfunction alone, a, su a supply demand imbalance alone or endothelial dysfunction alone. So what are conditions that can do that? Of course, we know what supply is. So for example, uh, the patient is hypotensive, um, therefore uh, the blood pressure is low, suddenly there's less myocardial oxygen being delivered to the myocardium. Or well, there can be a huge increase in demand, as I gave you the example with rapid atrial fibrillation. And there's a variety of other um, supply demand abnormalities that can lead to a type 2 myocardial infarction. The characteristic of a type 2 MI is the onset is usually in the setting of a serious medical illness, hypotension, respiratory failure with marked hypoxemia, rapid tachycardia, as I've already talked about, atrial fibrillation with a rapid ventricular response. And the underlying pathophysiology is not plaque rupture or fissuring with thrombosis, but markedly increased myocardial oxygen demand or markedly decreased myocardial oxygen supply 
Another example, severe anemia secondary to a gastrointestinal hemorrhage. So these are patients we see all the time in the medical intensive care unit in the emergency room. Type 3 MI it was added in for the World Health Organization. There are many hospitals throughout the world that don't have troponin, they don't have CKMB, they base the uh, diagnosis of MI on clinical grounds alone, um, and so that this would be uncommon for the, the Moscow hospitals, but if you had small rural hospitals, for example, in Siberia where there's not a troponin test, then you have to make the diagnosis based on clinical grounds, an electrocardiogram and the patient's symptoms, and that would be a type 3 MI, one in which um, you didn't have uh, a troponin value to help you. Um, then there are procedural injuries. We know we do, we do injury to patients, right? We cause injury with sometimes with angioplasty, we cause injury sometimes with coronary bypass. So these are, there are two types of MIs that are related to procedures, type 4 and 5, um, and a procedural injury uh, it occurs, same thing, elevated troponin, um, but uh, it has to be at least 20% from baseline, and there has to be some clinical characteristics suggesting that something bad has happened. So for example, here's type 4 MI. Um, this is an angioplasty-related increase of the biomarkers greater than five times above the baseline. Um, combined with clinical criteria, new ECG ischemic changes or an angiographic evidence that a, one of the coronaries, for, for example, a, 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 a one of the one of the small side branch arteries was closed or imaging evidence. In other words, you have to have, again, just like with type 1 MI, you have to have um, an image evidence that there was uh, ischemia involved. And type 5 is the same thing for surgery, except here we know the biomarkers are going to be higher because of, of uh, uh, unavoidable trauma to the myocardium during the surgery, needle uh, sutures and so forth. So it's 10 times the upper limit, um, as well as clinical evidence that there it was myocardial ischemia. Remember, though, that there's another category, the, the main category we talked about, myocardial injury, that's not an infarct because ischemia is not involved. And so a myocardial injury without ischemia is diagnosed when an abnormal troponin value is noted, but the underlying mechanism of cardiac injury is not ischemia. For example, cardiac trauma. Someone's in a car accident. The heart is bruised. Um, there's a bump in troponin. There's some EKG changes. But this is not a myocardial infarction because ischemia is not involved. And then, as I mentioned before, there are uh, uh, diseases where there's chronic low-grade injury to the myocardial cardium going on all the time, and there's elevated troponin all the time, chronic renal, some chronic renal failure patients, some severe heart failure patients will have these chronically elevated values. By the way, it's not good. Anytime you have an elevated troponin, it's not good. It means the heart's being injured by something. And if you look at renal failure patients who have elevated troponin, and you compare them to renal failure patients that don't have elevated troponin, those with elevated troponin do worse. They have more myocardial ischemic events and strokes and heart attacks and so forth down the road. And so again, very briefly, the reasons for elevation of cardiac troponin without ischemia, you can see here heart failure, viral myocarditis, cardiomyopathies, the Takotsubo syndrome, and a whole variety of procedures, catheter ablation, shocking the patient. All these things will, raise, will injure myocardium and raise the troponin. Um, and then here you see all of the non-cardiac things, sepsis, chronic kidney disease, stroke, and so forth, pulmonary embolism, etc. So there's still plenty of room for consensus and controversy. Even within the writing group, there's areas of where, where we're still um, arguing back and forth and waiting for more scientific data to help us settle some of these controversies. So let's, first of all, very quickly, the areas of consensus. Standardization of the definition of MI is needed for daily clinical work. Uh, before the definition came out, within the same hospital, doctors would be defining myocardial infarction differently, and when we rotated doctors at our hospital, sometimes the patient would be told the opposite. Oh, no, you didn't have a heart attack. Oh, I know the other doctor said you did have a heart attack, but I don't think you had a heart attack. Well, clearly, that's very bad for patient care. Um, of course, troponin, the high sensitivity came along, so we can very accurately pick up myocardial injury. Um, abnormal elevations in blood troponin levels 
troubles can occur in settings other than uh, myocardial infarction, where, where uh, myocardial ischemia is not present. Type 1 patients, we have all kinds of good guidelines for how to take care of those patients, but as you'll hear in a moment, we don't have good guidelines for how to take care of type 2 MI. Um, and troponin elevation alone is not an MI. You, you don't say, oh, the troponin's elevated, the patient had an MI. You must have clinical criteria for ischemia present. So, um, a number of controversies. Is the universal real, uh, definition really needed? And I've already told you the example why. There was confusion, confusion on the part of the doctors and confusion on the part of the patients. The use of the high sensitivity troponin has helped us a lot in that we can now identify even very small injuries to the myocardium, but we want everybody to define it together instead of the clinicians being uh, arguing with each other, the hospitals doing things differently clinical trials doing things differently. Um, previous definitions were often confusing and inaccurate and not useful for clinicians. Controversy two, what diagnostic and therapeutic interventions should patients with type 2 receive? The answer is we do not know. There's not solid clinical trial evidence yet to help us here. There's a little hint from the last meeting you heard about the European Society of Cardiology meeting recently in Paris. Um, it appears the statin therapy therapy um, instituted long term helps these patients. That's no surprise because 50% of type 2 MI patients have underlying previously not diagnosed coronary disease. So of course they'll do better if they're put on a statin. Um, but specifically in the hospital, we don't know what therapy uh, should we, should all these patients go to the cath lab for coronary angiography? What drugs should we administer to these patients? Basically, um, here's the data. So this is uh, one of the best studies because you can see Christian Terzen, my, my good friend in, in Aarhus, was involved. Um, and and uh, there's a conflict of interest here. I published this article in the journal that I edit. Um, but I think uh, this was uh, one of the best of the type 2 MI studies that was done. You'll see they studied 500 MIs from 2010 to 2011. Almost three quarters of them were type 1 and one quarter were type 2. The type 2 patients were older, more likely to be female, of course, because those are the people who are surviving to old age, and they had lots of comorbidities, lots of other illnesses. They had a much higher mortality compared to type 1 MIs, and 50% had normal coronary angiograms, um, and 50% and had coronary disease, compared to only 12% of type 1 MIs had normal coronary angiograms. And here's the long-term survival. You can see in blue the type 1 MI. They do much better than the type 2 MI in red. And that's not surprising because the type 2 MIs have all kinds of nasty diseases, gastrointestinal hemorrhages, pneumonia, respiratory failure, and so forth. The type 1 MIs do not have these comorbid conditions. By the way, the long-term survival for myocardial injury, non-ischemic, versus type 2 MI is the same. Uh, Again, these are very sick patients. Um, so one of the the implications is that these are very sick patients, so you don't rush them off to the cath lab because um, the cath lab might result in complications. You get the patient better, we think, and then you start to think about the evaluation of coronary disease. Do they need a, a stress test? Do they need a, a coronary angiogram? Or do they need nothing? Uh, because, in fact, this was not a, a, a real uh, a dangerous ischemic event. Uh, we think every patient should see a cardiologist after having had a type 2 MI. Um, but we don't know yet which acute interventions, which drugs in the hospital are a good idea. There's a number of trials underway. Um, and I already mentioned the recent possibility that statins help. Another area of controversy, what diagnostic and therapeutic me measures should be done to patients with myocardial injury that's not ischemic? The answer, we don't know. There's no clinical trial data yet to help us. What seems reasonable to me, that is common sense, handle the underlying illness once the patient is stable, either in-house or out as an, as an ambulatory patient, get a cardiology consult to decide which, if any further diagnostic or therapeutic 
therapeutic intervention should be undertaken. For example, a patient who's in a car accident and has a myocardial contusion that recovers probably needs no further cardiac evaluation other than to prove that the echocardiogram has returned to normal. So, as I said, we don't know what we should do. No clinical data here yet. Again, use your common sense, get the patient better, and then decide what evaluation to do. Fourth area, interventional and cardiac surgical uh, organizations don't agree with our level of troponin elevation. They want much higher levels. Um, our suggested level is five times for PCI, ten times for cabbage, but you'll hear other groups suggesting higher levels. Um, these numbers were arrived at by consensus based on literature review. Um, we expect further data on this in the future, and, and we may change these numbers at that time. And finally, how do you tell a type 2 MI from a non-ischemic myocardial injury? Careful clinical correlation and thought are required. Actually, is there evidence of ischemia? Has there been a significant change in the factors that determine myocardial oxygen uh, demand? For example, tachycardia. Is there clinical or ECG evidence of myocardial ischemia? In other words, the, the non-ischemic myocardial injury won't have clinical evidence that ischemia has occurred. And so this is actually the, uh, the final slide and the picture taken from the most recent document in 2000. 2018, and I suggest um, that, that you have a look at it. You can see on one, everybody has an elevated troponin level here in green. There's a rise and a fall. There's an acute ischemia group in pink that goes on to acute MI, um, or they uh, of either the type 1 or the type 2. If there's no acute ischemia, then it's an acute myocardial injury, acute heart failure, myocarditis, uh, myocardial contusion. And then the troponin level stays chronically elevated. That's an example of chronic ongoing injury due, for example, to, to structural heart disease, chronic kidney disease, and, and so forth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for outstanding presentation. Uh, uh, question, uh, what about I'll stop. Чтобы поставить диагноз инфаркт миокарда yeah. второго типа, написано yeah. минимальное изменение в коронарных артериях. How? Yes. So um, the evaluation of the patient depends upon your clinical assessment of the patient. So, I'll give you two examples. The patient has had a GI bleed. They've had a fairly, uh, you know, they, they were hypotensive. There's a, 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 a elevation in troponin. There was even some EKG changes. The patient's uh, gastrointestinal hemorrhage is treated. The patient stabilizes, and maybe before they go home, we, we would do either, for example, a CT angio, or even we might take them to the cath lab if it was a lot of ST depression. Let's take a different patient. The patient comes in in deep shock, secondary to gram-negative sepsis, and they have all kinds of complications, renal, acute renal failure, respiratory failure, so we don't rush those patients off for study. Um, the idea there is let's get the patient stabilized enough to be back on their feet. And that might be as an outpatient, but again, it would depend upon how strong the indications for ischemia were. You know, um, George Orwell's Animal Farm, all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. And it's the same thing with the clinical situation. You see, na just, just like uh, Professor Wodinski said, you know, you see something that says nasty ischemia is underlying here. That patient's not going to go home without a study. On the other hand, the patient that really there was just the elevation in troponin and maybe a small elevation. Okay, referral to an outpatient cardiologist. Thank you. I have a question uh, about uh, 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 MI with coronary spasm and uh, microvascular dysfunction. Yes. How we can prove it or more can disapprove it? And do you in huge clinical practices such a patients? Yes. The person who can answer that is sitting right there, but probably the number one world's authority on myocardial spasm. So 
the spasm is an interesting entity, you know. It's a, it's like a, a ghost, you know, because um, we always induce it, but the, you know, we always say it's there, but then we're not so sure. Sometimes it's obvious. You put the catheter in the coronary artery to do an angiogram, you see the spasm, um, and of course you can do the uh, the acetylcholine test in the cath lab. Um, what I always worry about, though, is maybe this patient, you know, it's true, true, and unrelated. Yes, they had an MI. Yes, they had spasm. Yeah. But A didn't lead to B, you know, uh, you'd have to have a problem with that. I know uh, it, earlier when I was at, uh, head of cardiology at UMass, we used to do ergonovine challenges e until we caused e a patient to have e a very e significant e MI e because e we e couldn't e relieve e the spasm. E so, uh, so um, e but, uh, you know, what we often, e I'll tell you what we often e do is we don't try and provoke it, but if we think it's spasm, we treat them. We treat them with vasodilators, nitrates, uh, calcium blockers, and then we follow them up and see how they're doing. Um, um, the problem is you also have to balance that against the group that has endothelial dysfunction. Um, and I'm not so sure we know exactly how to treat those patients. But when you get uh, Professor Cray up here, I think we repeat that question. Because I want to hear the answer of, of, of what he thinks too. And I know he and I have talked about this many, many times. Yes, and one more question. For example, if I met something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if I may, I may add something, uh, some 50 years ago, pathologists said that acute myocardial infarction is not related to coronary occlusion, and cardiologists should come, should do acute angiograms and demonstrate that this was wrong. So there is an acute occlusion, acute thrombus, and then between the time of onset and autopsy, it frequently disappears. So I think that the same story can be for uh, infarcts with no coronary obstructions, because we see the coronary angiogram at certain time point, and at the time point when the infarct started, there could be something completely different. Either complex spasm or thrombus which was dissolved, then also. Yeah. No, no, I agree. You know, something that we don't talk about very much. So we know, though, when we look at autopsy specimens, a lot of atherosclerosis, it's like cottage cheese. It's grungy. And, and I think it may very well be that some patients with that form of atherosclerosis are embolizing little, you know, chunks of, of atheroma or, or cholesterol downstream. And then, of course, we look, the angiogram doesn't show it, right? Because it's in small arterioles and so forth. So, you know, I think uh, um, I, I was particularly... Uh, drawn to, uh, again, Professor Kreia's diagram with the different kinds of, 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 of type 1 MI rupture you can have, and I think there's probably other ways, or, or possibly combinations. You know, it doesn't have to be A or B, it could be A and B, or even A and B and C. And I think, of course, you know, when we do angioplasty, we, there's almost 100% a slight elevation in troponin afterwards, if you measure it, which many people don't do, and the surgeons definitely don't do it. Um, and of course we send stuff downstream, but it's in, I always say it's in a good cause. The 99% LAD is now 0%, so the patient's prognosis for, for something bad happening is much less. Um, but of course, you know, we do differently. I mean, when you operate on somebody for appendicitis, you leave some injury that downstream may cause some trouble. But at the moment, we're doing something good for the patients. But we often leave a little residual that's going to be a problem later, and I think that's the same thing. Thank you. Uh, I'll use my privilege and I have a second question. Yes. Yes. For example, we have a patient with classical chest pain, classical ST segment elevation in ambulance and when he arrived to the hospital. For example, we have a zone in ECA. So the nitroponin. No, у нас там ничего нет с тропонином. Tell me what, what was the final question? А что же вы спрашиваете? Do we need uh, uh, troponin level? Нам нужен уровень тропонина. In such a case. В таком um, случае. Well. Важен ли он нам? The question, of course, is do, should you do a troponin level? What I can tell you, in my emergency room, anybody who has any symptom whatsoever gets a troponin level. So the problem isn't so much should we do the troponin level. The problem is what should we do about the troponin level? Um, you know, it's, it's, I, I think two-thirds of the patients who arrive in the emergency, the pediatric patients don't get troponin, but almost every adult that arrives in the emergency room gets a troponin. I mean, you're, people in car 
которых там нет ничего. Те, кто у кого болит сердце, и те, кто попал, например, в какую-то феморальную аварию, у них, конечно, будет повышенная интерфония. И When, when we have brand new interns on board. So uh, uh, this past July, I was doing cardiology uh, consults. Uh, the uh, patient uh, came uh, in with uh, a large uh, upper intestinal uh, gastrointestinal uh, bleed, uh, six uh, unit transfusions, uh, and bumped their troponin. And so I got a call uh, from the intern and said, don't you think this patient should go to the cath lab? And I said, only if you'd like us to kill a patient. Uh, because of course, they're in the midst, we're going to anticoagulate the daylights out of them. They just had a huge GI bleed. You want to make the GI bleed 10 times worse? Let's get the patient better. We would like to see the patient in clinic after they're back on their feet. Um, but, uh, uh, the problem isn't should we do troponins. The problem is should we do a lot less troponins. Профессор Филипп Крея. Профессор. Удовольствием. Знаете, вот есть лидеры, есть люди, которые создают направление в медицине. Вот профессор Крея известен тем, что он один из первых стал публиковать работы по микроваскулярной дисфункции, микроваскулярной стенокардии и по инфаркту миокарда без обструкции коронарных артерий. Так что пользуйтесь случаем, задавайте вопросы, информации с первых рук. Пожалуйста, Филипп Крея. Well, thank you again, Elena and Alexander, and for uh, uh, Elena asking me to discuss to this uh, fascinating uh, topic, which is MINOCA. This is a new acronym which stays for myocardial infarction with non-obstructive coronary arteries. And we have a surge of interest for MINOCA. Uh, Why? I'll tell you in a moment, but definitely we have a surge of interest. And indeed, uh, Minoka, for the first time, is in the universal definition uh, of myocardial infarction. Minoka was not in the third uh, definition of myocardial was, infarction. For the first time, uh, is there. And with Professor Alpert, well, we propose uh, to include Minoka in the fourth Albert definition, uh, and the task force uh, accepted this proposal quite promptly. And for the first time, Uh, Minoka is in uh, guidelines on STEMI, guidelines of the European Society of Cardiology. And Minoka is defined as myocardial infarction according to the universal definition, lack of stenosis, more than 50%. And no clinical overt specific cause for the acute presentation, for the myocardial infarction. But why, I was asking before, this surge of interest for Minoka? For three important reasons. First, is not rare. Uh, until some years ago, it was not clear that Minoka was so frequent. Between 5 to 10 percent of patients with myocardial infarction have Minoka. 10 percent is not a high, very high figure, but it's not low. If we consider the huge number of patients with infarction, we admit to our hospital 10 percent is one out of 10. It's a large number of patients. So first, Minoc is frequent, more than we thought before. Second, the outcome is not as good as we thought be before. This is a large study published by John Bertrami from, from uh, Australia. And what you see here is the in-hospital outcome and one-year outcome uh, mortality for Minoka in traditional infarction. And you can see that Minoka, the mortality of Minoka is slightly lower than that of, let's say, traditional infarction. But is about 4% at one year, and 4% is not a trivial number. No. Control population no. without infarction would have a mortality of 0.3%, which means that the mortality for Minoka is 10 times higher than a patient without Minoka. We shouldn't miss this patient. And you know, uh, we tend to lose interest in patients who come to the cath lab 
and we do not find the stenosis. If the stenosis is not there, we do see interest. This is a mistake, because Minoka, the outcome of Minoka is not so good. And also, when we come to quality of life, this is a study comparing patients with Minoka versus patients with obstructive atherosclerosis. And after the acute event, quality of life is similar and not brilliant in both population, patients with Minoka and patients with traditional infarction. This is why we should make an accurate diagnosis. When the patient comes to our attention with Minoka, chest pain, troponin raise, and frequently ST changes, ischemic ST changes, we must make an effort to make a diagnosis of the cause of Minoka. And if we work properly, if we follow the appropriate diagnostic workup, in the vast majority of these patients, we end up with a specific, a clear diagnosis. And we can identify six causes of Minoka or Minoka. Three epicardial causes, spas, plaque fissure with positive remodeling and dissection, and three, four microvascular causes of Minoka, unstable microvascular angina, Takosubo syndrome, myocarditis, and coronary thromboembolism. And with you, I will walk through these different possible etiologies of Minoka to show you that if we want to make an accurate diagnosis in this patient, we have the tools to make it. <laughs> Let's start with coronary spasm. Well, this is a patient, Joe, a patient with moderate LAD stenosis. Would you dilate this stenosis? No, I refuse to do it because OCT showed no thrombus. So what we did was to go for acetylcholine testing. And you see, the spasm is there. But listen, some years ago, two years ago, in the European Art Journal, we have published very rigorous diagnostic criteria for spasm. Spasm is responsible for minoca or for stable angina. First, when we see spasm at angiography, occlusive spasm, more than 90% reduction in lumen. Second, spasm is to cause ischemic ST changes. Third, spasm is to reproduce the same symptoms presented by the patient on admission. When we went for acetylcholine, this patient developed spasm. I tell you there was ST depression, and the patient told me, doctor, I have the same pain as before, as when I came. Now, Joe, you said this morning, if an animal looks like a lion, roars, and is stony, it's likely to be a lion, not a sheep. And I think this is a lion, cannot be a sheep. We can deny the existence of spasm simply because we will look for it. If we look for it and we have stringent diagnostic criteria, spasm can be found. And I tell you, if you look for it, it's found quite frequently. Uh, of course, we need stringent criteria. Spasm is responsible for Minoka only when you see spasm, we have ischemic ST changes, and the pain is the pain experienced by the patient. And what we are learning is not an endothelial disease. It's not endothelial dysfunction. What is wrong with spas is smooth muscle cells. Endothelial dysfunction can favor can uh, make spasm easier, but it's not the cause of spasm because endothelial dysfunction is frequent in the population. If you look here at the site of the stenosis, I'm sure it's plain of endothelial dysfunction, but spasm is not at the site of endothelial dysfunction. That is downstream. It's a different story. And what we are learning, Hiroshima Kao has been the mastermind behind this study, we are learning that the problem seems to be smooth muscle cells, in particular hyperactivity of rock kinase, which leads to a double phosphorylation of myosin light chain, and this predisposes to coronary spasm.
And then we have Black Fisher with uh, positive remodeling. We can have a sub and geographic Black Fisher. This is what Professor Bimsky said before. And definitely, this is an important mechanism of Minoka. This is a study published some, some years some years ago uh, from the state, a uh, population of uh, 42 patients who underwent IBUS uh, with Minoka who underwent IBUS, and in some of these patients, this was the cause of uh, Minoka. In this case, was a sub-angiographic plaque because of remodeling, and geographically the plaque was not so apparent, but was plaque fissure of uh, a sub-angiographic plaque, and CMR confirmed sub-endothelial uh, late enhancement, confirming the ischemic nature of Minoka. And then we can have coronary dissection. Uh, these are the key, key points of coronary dissections. It is more common among women, as you know, Sex-related hormones play a key role. Starting therapy is not recommended in the absence of atherosclerotic disease. We have also some negative message on the use of statin in these patients. Coronary intervention, if possible, better to avoid them because they tend to propagate the dissection only when the patient is electrically or hemodynamically unstable. And fibromuscular dysplasia needs to be investigated in other vascular beds, in particular carotid arteries. This is a very large uh, study published uh, the last year, a vast population of patients with myocardial infarction. Uh, the prevalence of uh, uh, dissection was about 1%. The outcome was similar to that of STEMI, and again, uh, PCI has to be performed only if the patient is hemodynamically unstable. Now we leave the epicardial arteries and we move to microvascular, to coronary microcirculation, because we can have microvascular causes of uh, Minoka. Uh, for instance, unstable microvascular angina is a cause of Minoka. This is a lady who came with Minoka, chest pain, troponin raise, baseline ECG was normal, but typical chest pain and troponin raise. Uh, we went for angiography, no stenosis, but uh, you can see that during acetylcholine injection, the patient developed severe ischemic changes. She complained again of the same pain with which she came to the hospital. She told me, doctor, I feel this precisely the same pain I had before, uh, but no spasm, so it is microvascular spasm relieved by nitrates. And why is it so important to make an accurate diagnosis in this patient? Well, this is a study we published uh, with Rocco Montone and Giampaolo Nicoli, very simply. We identified the population of patients with Minoka and no other apparent cause of Minoka, and uh, patients underwent acetylcholine testing, and you can see that patients with a positive test have definitely a worse outcome compared to patients with a negative test, proving again that the outcome of Minoka is guarded and that if we can make an accurate diagnosis, treatment becomes more effective. And then we have a Takotsubo syndrome. Well, here we had a, 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 a large controversy in the, for the fourth definition, because some consider Takotsubo syndrome an acute syndrome, others consider Takotsubo uh, a myopathy, a cardiomyopathy. Again, if the patient, when the patient comes with Takotsubo, he comes by saying, doctor, I feel chest pain, chest pain is there, troponin race is there, uh, ischemic ECG changes are there, why shouldn't this be an acute coronary syndrome. Again, if the animal looks like a lion and roars, it's likely to be a lion, not a sheep. And Takosubo patients come with chest pain, troponin raise, and DCG changes. Uh, we have been learning a great deal about the mechanism of Takosubo. We know that in 80% of these patients, there are triggers 
uh, emotional uh, uh, stressors or physical stressors, sometimes fear from cytoma, sometimes can be an acute psychiatric neurologic, neurologic disorder. Uh, there are triggers, emotional or physical triggers. But we also know that, fortunately, not all patients with strong emotions have Takosubo. So probably we have localizing factors, susceptibility factors, which we are learning. Definitely estrogen deficiency, because 90% of patients with Takosubo are postmenopausal women. 90%. So estrogens are probably important. But uh, the work from Tolusher in Zurich and Hiroshimokawa in Japan is also showing interesting alteration of the limbic system, which ex might explain why the strong emotion in some patients leads, leads to Takosubo. And then we have microvascular spasm, which is the final common pathway leading to ischemia. This is something we showed years ago with a very simple study. Uh, we submitted patients with Takosubo syndrome to infusion of adenosine. As you know, adenosine is a potent dilator of microcirculation. And you can see on the left, this is echo contrastography. You can see on the left, you can see the arrows showing this large area of hypoperfusion. And during adenosine infusion, this area was filled, became perfused, and also local, regional, wall motion alterations during adenosine improved, showing that dilation of microcirculation resulted in an improvement of function. Of course, part of myocardial dysfunction is also related to direct catecholamine myocardial toxicity. But in these patients, the amount of necrosis is very, very small. If you go for LGE, cardiac magnetic resonance, usually there is no delayed enhancement just because necrosis is not an important part of this syndrome. Uh, and the, the good news is that uh, cell survival cascade activation eventually in a large number of these patients, but not all of them, leads to recovery. All this has been uh, reviewed in this article we published some years ago with uh, Antonio Pelliccia and Paolo Camici. Uh, we have to identify these patients because the outcome is not as good as we thought initially. This is, these are results of this excellent global intertac registry, including about 1,500 patients with Takosubo around the world. And you can see that at 10 years, the incidence of MACE is about 50%. It's not a benign disease. What about treatment? We don't have prospective studies, but retrospective analysis seems to show that uh, um, ACE inhibitors and ARBs are associated to a better outcome, but not beta blockers. Beta blockers are not associated with a better outcome. And you know, if you think about it, it's not a surprise, because the main component of this disease is alpha constriction of microcirculation and beta blockade can make alpha constriction even worse. And then we have myocarditis, and this is another large controversy, because uh, for some, myocarditis cannot give minoca. I think that, in general, this is true, but with some exception. In particular, myocarditis caused by parvovirus B19 can mimic myocardial infarction. These patients typically come with chest pain, uh, ischemic ST changes, and when uh, uh, challenged with acetylcholine, as uh, Peter Ong and Udo Sekt made in Germany, you can see that in this particular type of myocarditis, acetylcholine uh, gives spasm, epicardial epicardial spasm. This is not surprising because, uh, uh, cyto, uh, because parvovirus B19 loves to sit in endothelial cells. So in this case in particular, spasm can indeed be related to endothelial dysfunction. And the proof of concept that in these patients with myocarditis caused by parvovirus, it is indeed minoca, is also uh, confirmed by cardiac magnetic resonance. Because 
because LG is typically subendocardial, as we see with ischemia. And then we have coronary thromboembolism. This is a typical example of a distal microembolism, and you can see that uh, the uh, thrombus extraction resulted, produced the thrombus, you can see uh, top right. Uh, and you can also see uh, distal embolization in the spleen and in the brain. And bottom left, you can see this large thrombus sitting in the left atrium. Again, you see how diagnosis is important to understand what is the cause of minoca. Minoca can be caused by all these different causes. It is important to know precisely what is the cause, because treatment has to be based on a precise knowledge of the mechanism of minoca. Prevalence of uh, distal of, of a thromb or coronary thromboembolism is rather low. 0.3% of patients with infarction, have infarction caused by thromboembolism is a small percentage, but this small percentage has to be identified. And this is the diagnostic uh, algorithm we proposed some time ago with Jean-Paolo Nicoli, which is substantially been uh, accepted by uh, STEMI guidelines. So the patient comes with infarction according to the fourth universal definition. Uh, Joe, we have to start on the fifth definition sooner or later, because I mean, things are already changing. Soon. So, so, OK, soon you'll call me. <laughs> So we have universal definition, uh, but universal when we go for coronary angiography, uh, no obstruction. Then the first thing to do is NLB angiogram. We are there. The interventional cardiology is there with the patient lying down, no stenosis. A simple LV gram can be very informative because it can be normal or can show wall motion abnormalities with an epicardial pattern. Well, in this case, we have to investigate epicardial causes of minoca, which can be spasm. If we suspect spasm, then provocative testing with acetylcholine or can be a uh, subangiographic fissure, and in this case, OCT in particular can be very useful. If the uh, LV gram is normal of regional wall motion abnormalities without an epicardial pattern, well, then we have a microvascular cause of minoca, which can be Takosubo syndrome. In this case, uh, the uh, LV gram is enough to tell us that the problem is Takosubo. Or we may suspect on clinical grounds a myocarditis and in this case, cardiac magnetic resonance and perhaps biopsy can be indicated. We may suspect microvascular spasm, and in this case, again, acetylcholine testing allows to make the diagnosis. If we suspect thromboembolism, coronary thromboembolism, then definitely, desperately, we need transesophageal echocardiography to identify potential uh, sources of thromboembolism. And from diagnosis, we move directly to uh, treatment. And as you can see, the treatment depends on the diagnosis, which is possible to make in each single patient just following a, a simple line, line of reasoning. If we have spas, then beta, uh, calcium antagonists work pretty well. If this subangiographic plaque fissure, then we need the proper prevention, double anti-aggregation and so forth. And the outcome is good, but we have to identify the cause of minoca. If this is spontaneous dissection, double anti-aggregation is enough. If possible, not PCI. If it is Takosubo, probably AC inhibitors, but still we have to learn a lot. If it is microvascular spas, calcium antagonist again, and the outcome is good. If this, sorry, if this myocarditis, well, then uh, we do not have specific forms of treatment just to, to follow the patient. If we have coronary embolism in the vast majority of these patients, anti-aggregation is not enough, and we need anticoagulants to deal with this uh, cause of minoca. Uh, in conclusion, my very last remark. Uh, I've been 
a doctor for the last 40 years, and uh, what uh, I've been learning is that I work better if I know the cause of the disease, if I know the precise mechanism of the disease responsible for symptoms of the patient I have in front of me, I work better. Well, this, this attitude, I think, is particularly important in Minoka. As doctor, we work better if we know the cause of Minoka. Thank you. Спасибо.